the Song of Solomon, chapter number 1. Before we read our text, I, whenever I'm in this, this, this book, I like to um, mention some things about this book. This book is a wonderful book. It's a poetic book. It's a book about a relationship between King Solomon and a, and a little maid. And it's a love story. Uh, now, men uh, try to quote unquote spiritualize the Bible sometimes. Uh, there's a certain uh, uh, facet of men that have tried to take this book and uh, draw it out as a picture of a relationship between Christ and his church. And you can draw inferences to that, but don't lose sight of the fact it is a literal love story between Solomon and this little Shunammite maid. Uh, because uh, if not, you'll get all messed up on some things because those who teach that this is a picture of Jesus and his church, they get mixed up on some things in some of the chapters. Uh, also, I want you to understand that this is not an easy book to read uh, because uh, sometimes uh, a verse is him speaking Sometimes it's her speaking. Sometimes it's the daughters of Jerusalem speaking. So you have to pay very close attention who's speaking as you're reading to get the full grasp of what is going on. So with that said, let's begin in chapter number 1. We'll start reading verse number 1. The Bible says, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for all the good testimonies. Our heart has been filled with joy tonight. To hear of the goodness of God, your protective hand. Lord, uh, your saving hand. Lord, your providing hand. Lord, your answering hand. Lord, uh, testimony after testimony. Lord, praise the goodness of our great God. Lord, we thank you for the good singing. We thank you, Lord, that uh, there wasn't more damage from the storm in the area to where we weren't hindered to not be able to come to church tonight. Now, Lord, we do pray for Miss Renee. We're thankful she's safe. But we pray for her and her neighbors there where that tornado set down. God, we certainly do pray for those that have been sick. We pray for the Kirtman family. We pray for Brother Doug. We pray for Miss Debbie. Lord, you touch them and help them. Lord, we're thankful for answered prayer. Lord, we pray for others, Lord, that are sick and maybe some providentially hindered, that, God, you would bless and help them. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help us from the Word of God. I pray you'd speak to our hearts as well as our minds tonight. And I pray that we do business with Almighty God. Lord, we need your touch, as the song was sung about. We need your help. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you do what only you can do in our midst. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight unsaved, we pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. God, we certainly pray for the saints of God. Lord, you'd build them up on their most holy faith. That, God, you'd increase uh, your righteousness in their lives. And, God, they would certainly shine as lights before this dark and depressed world that sinners would say, of more of us, what they have is real. Now, Father, do a work, and God, get glory to your name. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it. 
For it's in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. And amen. I want you to notice several things here. I want you to notice, first of all, in speaking of Solomon, we see there is affection from his word. Look again at verse number 2. It says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. I'm glad that we have one who's greater than Solomon. There was, they came from miles around to see Solomon in his glory, but Jesus Christ is greater than Solomon. And can I say when he kisses us, uh, he kisses us from the pages of his word. He shows us affection and the love of God uh, throughout the scriptures. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, friend, you can uh, feel like nobody loves you, but you can open this uh, wonderful word. Uh, you can get down there to 1 John 4, 4 19 and find out uh, we love him because he first loved us. Uh, you can get to John 3, 16, see that for God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, we can get over to Jeremiah 31, uh, find that he's loved us with an everlasting love. Uh, what a blessing uh, to find the affection, the kisses of God uh, on the pages of the word of God. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, but notice also the aroma surrounding his name. Look in verse number 3. It says, Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name uh, is as ointment poured forth. Uh, there's just something about the name of Jesus. Uh, it brings a refreshment uh, like a perfume to your nostrils. Uh, there's just something about... Uh, the aroma that surrounds our darling Savior. Uh, there's just something about uh, when you hear His name, uh, it's just like dew drops from heaven. Uh, how to bless you, uh, how to help you, uh, how to sustain you, uh, how to calm you. Uh, hey, and it'll save the darkest sinner. Uh, there's no name like the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we find uh, the affections of his word we find the aroma found in his name but there's also the attraction of the spirit of god uh, in verse number four it says draw me we will run after thee uh, the king hath brought uh, me into his chambers uh, can i say there's uh, nothing like the spirit of god uh, jesus said he must needs go away that the comforter would come uh, and uh, can i say uh, he also said, No man cometh unto the Father except he be drawn. Uh, my dear friends, uh, you and I didn't retain God in our knowledge. Uh, we were out in the fields of sin, uh, but he came to where we was. Uh, and through cords of love uh, and the sweet Holy Ghost, he began to draw us. Uh, he began to take away the appetite for sin uh, and began to work in our hearts uh, and convict us uh, and let us know uh, Jesus loved us, uh, and Jesus would save us. Uh, and my dear friends, at night you came uh, to trust in the Lord Jesus. Uh, it's because the Holy Ghost drew you. Uh, and can I say, uh, how many times since you've been saved, uh, maybe you've been upset, uh, maybe you've been worried, uh, maybe you've been perplexed, uh, and here comes the sweet Holy Ghost. Uh, and he begins to draw you to the Lord uh, and let you know it'll be all right. Uh, he just draws you to that inner place uh, where uh, you can just walk into the throne room of Almighty God uh, and find help in time of need. Uh, we see he's expounding about Solomon through the Word of God, but it's really talking about our Lord Jesus Christ and how much he has to offer us. What a blessing to have his word. What a blessing to know his name. What a blessing to have the sweet Holy Ghost indwelling us. But then this text shifts. It shifts from focusing on him to focusing on her. Now notice some things about her. Notice her appearance. In verse number 5, she says, I am black but comely. Let me stop right there. She's not referring to herself as an Ethiopian or a person uh, of color. She will expound what she's talking about in just a second. She says, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kadar. They tell me that the tents in Kadar were black in color. Uh, 
as the curtains of Solomon. Uh, they said the curtains of Solomon were a dark tan. Uh, but look in verse number 6. She says, look not upon me because I am black. She mentions it again. And here she explains what she's talking about. Because the sun hath looked upon me. She's talking about because she's been in the sun, her skin, uh, which should have been an olive color, has turned dark. Mm, I don't know about you, but there are some folks, they get in the sun, they turn dark, Miss Cinda. There are other folks get in the sun, they turn red, they blister, they peel, and it just is a process that happens over and over and over. Isn't that right, Lucas? He got a little sunburnt last week. Uh, but can I say, she is talking about, because she's been working in the fields, she's turned black. Now, in our culture, folks like a little color on them. They pay a lot of money to go to them tanning beds and, and do all that to get darker in their skin. And, and to be honest with you, if you pay a white, Chloe, you look a little anemic. You look a little sick. A little color makes you look a little healthier. It does. Me and Marcy's the only people in the room tonight. Our culture, people like a little color on them. But in Bible days, it was a picture of royalty if you had milky white skin. If you had no color on your skin, it meant that you lived in a palace. It meant that you didn't work in a field. You didn't work outside. You weren't exposed to the sun. And that was something that was not only wholesome, but that was something that was to be aspired to. She is saying, I am black, but come, I am black. I don't look on me. She's saying, because I'm not as attractive as those who live in the palace. She's talking about her appearance. You know, you can tell folks that work outside for a living. You can shake hands with a man, know a man that works with his hands. They're calloused dried and cracked she's saying don't look on me I, I'm not one of the maidens that stays in the palace she deals with her appearance notice she also deals with there were some who were angry with her look in verse 6 again she said my mother's children were angry with me her brothers and sisters are now angry with her I don't know if it's because of the work she's been doing or because of the relationship she has with Solomon. But her siblings are angry with her. Can I say, you can try to work hard in this world and you can try to live close to God and you can try to mind your own business and you can still make people angry at you. Hmm? We see she's dealing with her appearance. She reveals that her siblings are angry with her, but then she lets us know the assignment that's been laid upon her. She says, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Because they were angry with her, they made her keep the vineyards. Or maybe because of her relationship with Solomon, they said, okay, we're going to show you. You've got to keep the vineyards. I don't know why they laid them upon her, but they did. And because of that, she's working outside, and she is black but comely. Now listen, I've preached on these vineyards in years gone by, um, but let me just give you some things about vineyards. Vineyards were great commodities. If you owned a vineyard, you were well off. Mm -mm. It's kind of like owning a pickup truck today. I mean, you're sitting good if you got a truck. I'm trying to get y'all to smile. Somebody is really not enjoying the Lord tonight. But if you had a vineyard, they were great commodities. 
Can I say, there was a lot that came from vineyards. We know grapes come from vineyards, but there was a whole lot more that came out of a vineyard than a grape. You got raisins from vineyards. You got uh, 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 rubbing alcohol from vineyards. You got acid from vineyards. Uh, uh, can I say this? Molasses came from vineyards. Uh, wine came from vineyards. Uh, 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 can I say that vineyards uh, also produce fragrant oils? Uh, all of those things could be sold uh, and brought you much wealth. Uh, uh, if you had a vineyard, you were sitting pretty. Uh, 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 but the vineyards uh, ha uh, had a lot of work that had to be done in them. Can I say that vineyards were usually built on a hillside? So they're on a hillside. Can I say that vineyards also uh, 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 had a hedge about them to keep the animals out? You didn't want the deer getting in there eating the grapes. Uh, then you'd have no crop. Uh, so there was uh, hedges built around them. Uh, vineyards also uh, uh, had to be cleared of stones. Uh, the vines wouldn't grow if you had a lot of rocks around. Uh, so you had to clear them out, clear all the stones out. Uh, uh, again, a lot of work in a vineyard. Uh, uh, can I say the vineyards uh, uh, had vines that had to be planted into them on a regular basis? Uh, vineyards had a watchtower. Uh, uh, so the keeper of the vineyard uh, 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 would stay in the watchtower and watch over them, make sure that uh, uh, nothing was going in there and carving uh, uh, the, uh, the crop or the vines uh, uh, so that they'd have something uh, uh, when it was uh, harvest time. Can I say this? Uh, a vineyard, you also had to construct a press uh, to press the grapes, uh, uh, to get the juice out of the grapes. Uh, uh, and can I say, you also had to have a vat, uh, and the vats were usually hewed out of rocks. Uh, so there was a lot involved uh, in keeping a vineyard. Uh, can I say, uh, mm, when it came to doing the work, you had to prune the vines. If you had dead vines growing again inside the live vines, you had to prune the dead ones out. When you prune them out, they would grow. Can I say that happens in churches? Sometimes God prunes out something so the church will grow. Sometimes there are people sitting in the church that's hindering the service, uh, hindering the work of God, and God will just prune them out so the thing will grow. Uh, can I say this? Uh, 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 vineyards also, uh, you had to dig around the roots uh, 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 because you had to keep the nutrients flowing to the roots, uh, and you had to dig out and make sure there was good soil around the roots. Uh, uh, can I say that's what preaching does around here? God's digging all around, make sure we got fertile ground. Uh, uh, so we'll grow thereby. Uh, can I say you had to keep the ground free from weeds? Sometimes you got weeds amongst the wheat, and you got to weed them out. Preaching will do that too, by the way. Can I say this? Uh, uh, you also uh, 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 had to uh, uh, elevate the fruit-bearing vines up off the ground. I don't know if you've ever seen a vineyard. The vines are all up off the ground. Uh, they won't grow grapes on the ground what they do is they cut out the dead branches and the dead vines uh, and, and the dead stalks they leave them on the ground uh, uh, that would hinder any kind of critters trying to get up to the fruit bearing vines uh, can I say mm, they had to constantly be worked it's not like planting corn and showing up in the fall and plucking it you constantly were working the vineyard. Now, look again, verse 6. She said, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. She was so pre preoccupied in keeping the vineyards of her brothers and sisters, she left hers unkept. Can I say that's what's wrong in the church today? We're so preoccupied with the wrong vineyards. We're preoccupied with the vineyard of our jobs or our work. Now, don't get me wrong. You need to work. The Bible said a man doesn't work. He shouldn't eat. You've got to work. But some people are so consumed with work, they forget about the important vineyard. Some people are so preoccupied with their household, all the chores, uh, preoccupied with keeping the house up. You ought to keep the house up. If you don't maintain your house, it'll fall apart. You ought to clean your house. If not, you'll be nasty. Nobody likes nasty. Uh, 
You know, keep a clean house. You never know who's going to show up. Uh, but some people are obsessed with a clean house. Mm, they leave the important vineyard unkept. Can I say? Some are preoccupied with their hobbies. Nothing wrong with having a hobby as long as the hobby don't have you. Some people spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on their hobbies and never give a dime to missions. Something wrong with that. Some people never miss watching their team play, but they don't have any problem missing church. They're preoccupied with the wrong vineyard. Hmm? Can I say this? Some people's hobbies... Whatever it may be, consume so much of your time and your thinking that you don't spend time with the Lord. You're preoccupied with the wrong vineyard. Hmm. Some people are so preoccupied with their neighbors. Y'all ever see that Andy Griffith show when Andy... And Barney accused Aunt B and this other woman of being busybodies, knowing about everything going on in the town, spreading rumors all the time. And so they started kind of one with Andy, and Andy and Barney ran with that thing, and they had all the men on an uproar about all this thing, uh, about this uh, it, guy was a shoe salesman. They had him uh, all thought out he was going to be some big Hollywood producer, and they all showed up in his hotel room, and they're playing saxophones and harmonicas and all that. And all he's trying to do is sell them shoes. They're all buying shoes. Um, but they all got hoodwinked into that thing. Can I say, so many people are so preoccupied with their neighbors, they never look in a mirror. Hmm? We, got a, we got a couple in our neighborhood. Now, you'd think it'd be the women that know everything that's going on in the neighborhood. We got two old men in our neighborhood they know everything in the world about it. And you better not get stopped by them. It don't matter if you run a lawnmower, a weed eater. If they come by, you better not look at them because they'll stop you and they want to know about everything. And they know about everything in the whole neighborhood. Uh, they know, I mean, they know how much people make. They know what people drive. They know where uh, uh, they got relatives from. They know everything in the neighborhood. Busy bodies. Well, some of you all know a whole lot about a lot of people but you tend to ignore your own vineyard. Isn't it amazing how we can very quickly find fault in others? But we never see our own faults. They're preoccupied. So this is what I want to preach on tonight. I ought to preach on who's keeping your vineyard. Somebody's keeping it. Or nothing's happening at all. Hmm? The sad reality is a lot of our lives are like an unkept vineyard. We got weeds, we got rocks, we got critters, we got things that don't belong in our life that's hindering fruit from being produced. You say, I thought vineyards were only for the well-off. Do you realize you're a joint heir to the throne of Christ if you're, if you're saved? Yeah. You can't get any more well-off than you. And one of the first things he gave you was a vineyard. And he expects fruit from the vineyard. If you're not careful, you'll be too busy checking everybody else's vineyard out and you're leaving yours undone. You're too busy and preoccupied with other vineyards and yours is unkept. I want to have a vineyard that pleases the Lord, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, how can we have that pleasant vineyard? One that pleases the Lord. Well, can I say, first of all, you can have a vineyard that honors God and that God is pleased with through self-examination. Do you know the Word of God teaches us that if we examine ourselves, we'll not be judged? How do we examine ourselves? Not basing everything on what we think we are. Do you know the Bible says in Jeremiah that uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and no man knoweth it? You don't even know what's in your own heart. 
So how can I judge myself? How can I examine myself through the Word of God? The Bible says try the spirits whether they're of God. How do you do that? Through the Scriptures. You know through the Word of God I find out how rotten I can be. Through the Word of God I find out where all the rocks are in my vineyard. Through the Word of God, I find out uh, where the hedge has been broken down so critters can get in. Uh, through the Word of God, I find out where things need to be uh, uh, dressed up and taken care of. Uh, 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 my dear friends, uh, uh, you and I can have a vineyard that pleases God through self-examination. Don't wait until your vineyard's destroyed before you get serious about it. Mm -mm. Through self-examination. Don't wait for somebody else to fix your vineyard. It's your vineyard. God gave it to you. And you're responsible for God. Can I say this? Not only through self-examination, you can have a vineyard that pleases the Lord through spiritual extraction. I have found that the Spirit of God is real good about telling me things that are in my vineyard don't belong there. Hmm. And he'll just put his finger on things, and if I'll get rid of them, Brother Bob, repent of those things, uh, guess what? My vineyard runs well. But if I mm, kind of push them off to the corner of my vineyard, Brother Brian, it's not good. You see, we try to sweep things under the carpet, but God sees it all. You know we're all naked before God? Nothing's hidden before God. He sees it all. And when the Spirit of God, through the Scriptures, uh, puts His finger on some things in your life, uh, friend, you get rid of them, God will bless you. There's some things you aren't doing you need to be doing. He'll tell you. You start doing them, He'll bless you. You'll start seeing some fruit in your vineyard. But my dear friends, when we disobey, you're, not going, you're going to find a drought in your vineyard, not some fruit. Huh? How in the world can we have a vineyard that pleases the Lord? Well, through scriptural edification. Hmm. David said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The scriptures are our best friend in the world. They lead us and guide us into the ways of righteousness and the paths of righteousness. And the scriptures will help us and help our vineyard. You say, Brother Doug, I just don't understand the Bible that well. Start in John, then read Romans. Don't worry about reading the whole book of John in a day. I'd rather you get one or two verses down than ten chapters and not understand what you read. Start reading it. Say, God, show me. Hey, part of the Holy Spirit living in you, a part of His office work is to lead you and guide you into all truth. Uh, he'll teach you the Word of God. He'll show you things. Uh, he's just looking for you to be hungry for it. And when you get in the Scriptures, He'll edify you. He'll build you up. He'll help your vineyard. There's nothing like the Word of God. Hmm. Now, it's no secret my darling wife loves all the flowers and plants around our house. Matter of fact, when we was gone last week, it was so dry, some she had in the hanging basket dried up, so she's already replaced them. Hmm. My wife, even through drought season, has pretty flowers and pretty plants. She's learned a secret. She's got this stuff she mixes with water, some kind of miracle grow stuff, these little blue crystals. And she puts that in, and overnight, them say, she cut every hosta back this year, and I thought, hallelujah. They're, I'm not kidding you. We've got hostas as big as Volkswagens in our yard right now. And I, and I mean, we cut them back just a couple months ago. What happened? She's learned a secret. She puts that stuff on them, and man, they grow. She's also got stuff she puts on them, and it causes the bunny rabbits not to like the taste of them. So they quit eating on them, and bugs quit eating on them. So they look real pretty. We have people stop all the time and say, Oh, your yard looks so pretty. I say, Thank you. I did that. Uh, she's learned a secret. 
You know why some people just seem to look prettier? Why some people just seem to be a little more spiritual? Why some people just seem to have a glow about them? They've learned the secret to being built up. It's called the Bible. The more the Bible you put in you, the more you're going to grow in the Lord. The more you're going to, the world's going to see Jesus in you. And the secret is not some pill you take or some crash course somewhere. The secret is a daily diet of the word of God uh, it has all the nutrients to make you a super Christian mm. uh, how's your vineyard looking mm. Mm. preacher how can I have a pleasant vineyard one the Lord uh, really delights in well you've got to be found in supplication and earnest it's one thing to pray it's another thing to pray earnestly the Bible says the fervent, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word fervent means being earnest, to take it serious. I mentioned that movie about Sheffy. Uh, Sheffy got indicted by the council of the Methodist Church because they said he prayed very oddly, and he prayed very long. He'd pray for hours at a time. They found fault in that. And they found fault in the fact that he prayed very oddly. They said, you pray like you're just actually having a conversation with God. Sheffy says, well, who do you talk to when you pray? Huh? Can I let you know a little secret? You can't impress God praying, thou God. <laughs> thou knowest all things. He's not impressed with your verb, verbiage. But when you just talk to him from your heart and pour out your heart before him, God resisted the proud but gives grace to the humble. And can I say, when you pray in earnest and grab a hold of the horns of the altar and talk to God, and God rewards you openly for that, friend, your vineyard will never be barren when it's bathed in prayer. I thought about this. Your vineyard, my dear friends, will be pleasant to God when you learn the secret of serene enthrallment. What is that? You've got to learn to meditate on the Lord, on His Word, and on the goodness of God. I don't know how many times I get to thinking about a message I heard preach. I get to thinking about a verse I've read. This message came because I got to thinking about this verse tonight. Can I say, when you meditate on the things of God, it grows you. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. By the way, you find none of that on the news. He said, those things, said if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. We're to present ourselves a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And we're to renew our minds. How do we renew our minds? We've got to get rid of all the junk we've heard. Some of you work next to people that are foul mouth. Some of you, uh, 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 you, you, you got it on the news, or you've heard uh, 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 somebody that had something to say that was negative, or maybe you, uh, uh, your spouse getting saved and they're negative all the time. If all you put in is negative, nasty stuff, you're going to turn out negative and nasty. Back when I learned to uh, program computers, now don't ask me to fix your computer. When I learned that, that was, you know, floppy disks were still out and they were nine inches. We didn't, we didn't do any of this microprocessing stuff that you all deal with today. Well, we, we had something called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, garbage is coming out. You know why some people are always negative? They always see the glass half full. They're always Debbie Downer. It's because they just put negative stuff in. Paul said if there be anything of praise, anything of virtue, anything that's good, anything that is righteous, any, he said think on that stuff. 
When your mind is preoccupied with the goodness of God and the blessings of God and all that God has done in your life uh, and all that you've seen and heard God do, uh, when you think on those things, my dear friends, it starts showing up in your vineyard. Somebody comes around negative and you'll say, but praise the Lord, he's been good to me. Uh, you'll turn that thing around. You'll have your vineyard pleasing to the Lord when you do all these things and one more thing when you set your sights on eternity see your vineyard gets messed up when you're looking around your vineyard gets straightened out when you start looking up uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith when you set your sight on, sights on eternal things on things that really matter because to be honest with you most everything we deal with a hundred years from now is not going to matter but when you set your sights on things that matter for all of eternity it'll help your vineyard all of a sudden being obsessed with running the sweeper 47 times in your house in a day won't matter hmm? what'll matter is how many tracks you passed out how much time you prayed how much time you sought the Lord because those have eternal consequences my dear friend so the answer to the question who's keeping your vineyard if it's not you no one is and if you're not keeping it no one's keeping it and then all of a sudden the devil will move in and destroy it and I don't mind the devil's workshop and an idle vineyard is prime real estate for the devil to take up shop. Friend, we have an enemy. And he wants to destroy your vineyard. Because if you've got a pleasant, beautiful vineyard, people walking by say, look how good God's been to them. They'll take knowledge that God's done something in your vineyard he hadn't done in their vineyard. And they'll want to know your God. So the devil wants every vineyard wrecked and destroyed. So people will say, oh, their God's not that good. See, the goodness of God does not hinge on us. But the goodness of God is revealed when we keep our vineyards to his praise and to his glory. So who's keeping your vineyard? Don't become so preoccupied with pleasing people because that's what she's doing. She's saying, my mother's children were angry with me. They laid upon me their vineyards. Their vineyards have I kept, but mine I have not kept. She was trying to please them and take care of their vineyards. She let hers go to pot. And can I say, when you're trying to please people, you'll never get it done, friend. They constantly put more. You remember Cinderella's stepmother? Cinderella could do no good in her eyes. Hmm? And can I say, you'll never, ever be good enough to appease and please people. But you can keep your vineyard, and that'll please the Lord. And I'd rather please Him than everybody in the world. I wonder tonight, how's your vineyard? Hmm? How, is it? How is it? See, a lot of times... We don't know how it is. See, the Lord already sees us in glory, Brother Clint. He's already seen your vineyard and the final outcome. I had a fellow tell me one time, he traveled a lot, preached a lot around, he said, some places you go, the corn's about this tall. Other places about this tall. And then other places about this tall. See, the Lord sees the fruit from the vineyard. You get to look around and you say, well, my, my vineyard's looking pretty good, is it? How many empty husks are in that corn you've got grown up? See, the only one that really knows what your vineyard looks like is him. So if you want to know how your vineyard's looking, you've got to ask him. Lord, are you pleased with my vineyard? Lord, I'm sure pleased with you, but are you pleased with me? How's your vineyard looking? When's the last time you asked the Lord? Lord, 
Try me. Judge the integrity of my heart. Is my vineyard pleasing unto thee? Let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come get a song of invitation. Who's keeping your vineyard, friend? How's it looking? Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, if we didn't have the word of God, we'd never read verse 6. Never would have pondered the question about our own vineyards. God, I pray you'd help our vineyards be pleasing unto thee. And I pray the vineyard of Emmanuel Baptist Church would be pleasing unto thee. I pray you'd be glorified in it. And I pray there'd be much fruit abound to your glory. God, I pray you'd bless now this invitation. I know it's not been a salvation message, but Lord, if somebody's lost, I pray the sweet Holy Ghost convict them of sin. We'd see them saved. Lord, I pray for the saints of God. Lord, you'd instill in them a desire to have a pleasant vineyard as unto the Lord. Bless now. We'll thank you for it. Speak to hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.